Welcome back to Oklahoma Gardening. Today we have a full show. We first check in on the progress of the new Frontiers construction and landscape installation. Dennis Martin has the solution for nut sedge. We learn about some of the beneficial insects we might find in the garden and what diseases to be on the lookout for. And finally, I'll share with you how to manage tree dieback. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Oklahoma Gardening is also a proud partner with Shape Your Future, a program of the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust. Shape Your Future provides resources for Oklahomans to make the healthy choice the easy choice. I love sharing with you guys the cool things that plants can do. We're back here at the student farm. I want to share with you a tropical plant that you might find in some Oklahoma landscapes. It's important to know which plants we are dealing with so that we can continue to maintain them successfully for years to come. We're back inside the construction zone of the New Frontiers Ag Hall that will soon be open to students come this fall. And we're following up again with Nicolette with Landscape Services. Thank you for joining us out here Pleasure. and letting us in this construction area. But we're at a critical point, right? A lot of the construction starting to wrap up. Tell us what the next phase is. I really do feel this is probably the most crucial part of, uh, you know, the most important obstacle that most people probably don't even realize how important it really is. I mean, in order to have your soil um, have the right type of soil for the right type of plant material. Mm -hmm. So it's the bed pet brand. Uh, getting that is uh, just leads to the success and maintenance of overall uh, of your plant health. So that's where we're here getting started on today. As you can kind of see behind me, we have uh, different types of soil. Again, it, this is our bed prep. So basically um, every spot that you see that uh, uh, is a planting bed around the building, has different types of soil and different types of amendments that uh, are specified based on the plant material today. Okay, so, you, so we've got kind of some concrete edging. That's going to differentiate the planting bed from we're standing in what will be a turf grass lawn area? That's exactly right. So this area here, we've got down about three or so inches. Um, and we're gonna come in after we finish the bed prep of the, of the planting beds, which is gonna be up in this little area on the mm -hmm. south side. And we'll come in and then finally grade this as well and uh, prepare it for some turf. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what's going into your bed preparation. Obviously, you're wanting to cater it towards the plants you've selected, um, whether they're the pH or the organic matter, but let's talk about the components you're putting in some of that. That's right. So we have a sandy loam, which is what we have kind of in this pile right over here. Okay. Uh, and that uh, was mixed in with some compost. Um, that is actually comes from our campus. So it's the leaf matter, organic matter that uh, uh, we are trimming, doing the trimmings on, or if we have an ice storm or windstorm, we gotta remove some trees, uh, clean up those leaves in some certain areas. All of that comes back to our compost yard. Uh, it is then broken down into uh, good compost that we are able then to mix into our our planting beds. Okay, and is it a matter of just putting it straight onto the existing soil or what's the That's That's a great grading. question. So it depends on the plants about how deep we really want to go, but the deeper is the deeper we can go, the better. Okay. Um, and uh, it's really, you know, whenever we're on a site like this, we have 100% or 99% construction, compacted construction soil. Yeah. And uh, so there's not much aeration, water flow, drainage of any sort occurring on this here. It's basically just running right off. Which means plant roots can't really get into no, that either. No, this is anaerobic conditions, yeah. not suitable for most plants, I would say. And uh, so what we're trying to do is really get in there with these backhoes that you see behind me and uh, scarify that, which is basically the process of breaking, loosening that up and uh, getting in some good uh, soil that uh, is more uh, beneficial with whatever we're trying to amend for those plants. Okay, are you doing that both before and kind of as you're adding and incorporating it a little bit or it's, is there a, a gradient yep, there, so a line? We, um, we've had the general interface. contractor that has gone through and prepped uh, the, the initial grade based off of uh, our civil plans. Um, and we have left certain planting beds to be at a depth 
of oh maybe eight inches I'd say on the one behind us here okay. and uh, so that's where we're starting our scarification and the breaking of the soil is at about eight inches below final grade uh, of where that mulch layer will be. Okay well and obviously we haven't talked irrigation that's got to go in the soil somewhere so when is that going in? So we have uh, exterior of the buildings done. We have a lot of the storm infrastructure or the uh, utility infrastructure in place. Now we have our irrigation. That is in process as we speak. We're just getting ready to start that boring underneath critical sidewalks, underneath um, certain areas to get into each planting bed. So every bed, every turf space, every green space has got irrigation. So we have to stub up our main line and laterals and that's occurring already. Okay, so that's starting to happen as well, which obviously with heavy equipment, you still gotta be careful with working around all of that, I would imagine too. It makes it a little difficult <laughs> over here. Not only do we have our crews still working here, uh, they've got uh, furniture going in, so there's a lot of stuff interior going in. Um, and then we still have people on the outside still doing the final touches of the windows and the roof. And uh, so it, it makes it for a very challenging. So we have to really work together. We work uh, with the project manager, knowing which area we're going to start in, telling them the scope of how long it's going to take. And we transition then all the way around the building to kind of make sure we hit every spot that we all need right. to. All right. So you're kind of staging it so you all can get your work done. Well, I know last time we were filming on the east side, and there's still a little activity, but there's also a few new additions back there. Can you tell us? a little bit about those. The east side is going to be well used I think by the students. We have a big plaza area there, a main pathway that's a corridor that kind of connects the areas through campus and on that plaza area we have what is called a living wall and um, it's a, a wall that's about 10 foot tall, 30 feet wide wow. and it's going to have uh, about 200 and some individual plants on it that make a special design that we change throughout the season and uh, I think it'll just add to the, the atmosphere and kind of create the social uh, ambiance that uh, gets people engaged. Absolutely. So you're going vertical with some of the plants going as well. Going vertical with plants. It's, uh, uh, you got to have some fun, exciting things out there. And I think this will be an opportunity to get your pictures taken next to it. Absolutely. And just kind of provide that uh, grand entry into the Dairy Bar Plaza. It's another main entry on campus. So I think it's going to look and feel fantastic. For that's, the that's awesome and exciting. So next step is planting. We'll check back with you on that. Can't wait to see some plants go in the ground, but we got a lot of work here ahead of us. Absolutely. So well, we'll, I'll let get you get this. back to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our summertime heavy rains and also following substantial winter kill in Bermuda grass has led to a lot of complaints and questions regarding sedge invasion in lawns and landscapes. I'd like to review some of the features of sedges, how to identify them from grasses, and also what are some of the integrated practices that can help us manage and reduce sedge in turf and the landscape. Here in my hand, I'm holding actually yellow nut sedge. Now this is a perennial species of sedge and uh, it's quite common throughout the United States. It's common in gardens, landscape beds, and also turf grass areas. Nut sedges are a member of the Cyperaceae, that's the sedge family. It's a very diverse family and there's many members that are valuable to us, such as the carrick sedges that are used as turf. There's actually some edible ones like chufa, where we can eat the tubers. And then also we use papyrus, which is a Cyperus genus member also, as an ornamental. And also it was used to generate some of the first writing surfaces. Now in our landscapes, we can get sedge invasion into ornamental beds and also into lawn areas. Something that these sites have in common is usually there's less competition from the desired plant materials. So in our turf grass area here, we have a lot of traffic, we've got soil compaction, we've got thinning turf. So all the practices such as proper mowing, fertilization, irrigation, aerification, anything that involves recuperation or reducing traffic helps to reduce the potential from the sedge invasion. Now, sedges and grasses, what's some of the differences? Sedges are three ranked, meaning that the leaves come out in three separate directions, whereas with grasses, they're two separate directions. You may have also heard sedges have edges, way of memory, and that's because they're 
triangular in cross-section, whereas grasses are flattened or round. And again, sedges three ranked, leaves three directions, grasses two directions. Integrated methods of control in landscape beds involve uses of fabric to reduce invasion from tubers or seed that are germinating, use of mulches to cut down on sunlight that gets to them. We might also use highly targeted herbicides in directed sprays away from the plant. Just some of the more common herbicides for use in Bermuda grass lawns, which is our dom dominant turf grass species in Oklahoma, we can use products like Sedgehammer, active ingredient halosulfuron. We can use Certainty, active ingredient sulfosulfuron. And then also, if we've got buffalo grass or tall fescue, we could use Tenacity, active ingredient mesotrione. So those are just some of the herbicides that can be used for sedge control. We always want you to think about an integrated strategy. Think about healthy plant materials first, exclusion, then turn to herbicides later on and you should be able to get very close to 100% suppression or control of the sedges. Hello, it's springtime in the garden and I brought some beneficial insects to look at today. Now that plants are growing and the sun is out, we're seeing a lot more bugs in the garden. And sometimes it's difficult to tell whether that bug is a good bug or this bug is a bad bug, especially since there are some types people are unfamiliar with. And so we're gonna look at some really cool things that you might not normally think of as good bugs. We have surfid flies. These are hover flies or flower flies. They go by a lot of different names. And on these, the adults are pollinators and the really aggressive predators are the maggots. They are on the undersides of leaves going through and just eating aphids like nobody's business. Lady beetles, of course, very common. The adult lady beetles do eat aphids and small soft-bodied insects, but the larvae on lady beetles are also incredibly voracious predators, snapping all, up all sorts of little yummy bugs that might be destroying your plants. We have some oddballs here, we rove beetles. They're very fast, very predacious, and very distinctive with their short wings but most people never notice them because they're close to the ground near the soil. We have lace wings, green lace wings, and the lace wing larvae also is a predator along with those. We have a strange group of flies called uh, robber flies. They're also big eaters on any insect that is smaller than them. The praying mantis, We'll see them everywhere. They're also good bugs. We have parasitoids, which are tiny wasps that actually lay their eggs in other bugs to kill them. One critter you see a lot in the late summer is the wheel bug. It's a big assassin bug, has a huge long beak. It might bite you, it's painful, so leave it alone but it's such a beneficial animal. It eats all sorts of things that might be feeding on your plants. So look at it, learn it, and then just leave it alone to do its job. For more information about beneficial insects that you might find in your garden, check out this fact sheet. into the main part of the 2024 growing season. There are a couple of insect and disease things I wanna to mention to be on the lookout for. With regards to insects, it's hard to make a prediction 
of what we will definitely see each year. But a general thing to consider is that if you had a problem with a certain insect last year, you're very likely to see it this year. Uh, so it, maybe you had aphids or bagworms or something. Think about when you saw them June, July, August, and start scouting for those arthropods about a month in advance. And that way, if there are any uh, cultural or chemical applications that you wanna make, you can be sure to do them so that you minimize the amount of damage you have. One of the most common diseases that we're finding throughout Oklahoma is called pear rust. So this pear has quite a few leaf spots and blemishes due to pear rust. This disease has has a really complicated life cycle in that the infection on the pear has blown in from juniperus species like eastern red cedar. Those spores blow to the pear right when they break bud and by May and June you're starting to see larger blotches on the pear leaves. Some of the leaves may fall off. By late June and July on the underside of the leaves you'll start to see these hair-like projections where spores are gonna blow back to the junipers so that the, they will develop the disease next year and the infection continues. Um, the time to treat the pears is not actually when you see the rust disease. It's actually at bud break and for the next month following bud break. So all of this damage is basically what this is going to do this season. And in some trees, it can be nearly the entire tree with the leaf spot problem. Other trees, it may only be a percentage and it just reduces the overall quality. I also want to talk about some dieback diseases that we're seeing in trees. So we're going to look at a jujube uh, to show you those symptoms. Oklahoma's weather the past few years has been pretty crazy with temperature extremes, drought, um, wind, hail, ice damage, and all of those injuries create small cracks and cause our trees to either be weakened or stressed. A lot of times this results in what we call dieback or decline. If we leave this dead and dying wood in the tree, it can be an entry point where insects that are attracted to those weakened trees will start to feed and infest a tree or plant pathogens that might cause cankers and move into larger parts of the wood can enter through those weakened or damaged branches. So although it might be a little labor intensive, a tree like this one is still quite salvageable. Uh, you can use your loppers, your hand pruners, or even saws to start cutting out this wood. It'll improve the overall appearance of this tree and you might also remove some things that could otherwise move into the larger parts of the wood and kill the tree. So if you're seeing general branches dying or in decline, go ahead and prune those out and hopefully the tree will go on to serve you well for many more years. Today we're looking at pruning up this jujube tree and what we're really doing is pruning it because it's sort of been neglected for the past couple of years and every season we look up into the canopy and we see that there's some dead branches in there. Um, and when you're pruning anything, one of the first things that you should cut out of any plant is the dead plant material. So you can see we have several branches in there um, that have just declined and, and have decided to uh, die on us, but then we also have some that have actually um, ripped back. So it might have been because of an ice storm or something like that. And we want to make sure that um, we're cutting these out, that we actually have clean cuts so that we don't have that kind of tearing on the bark that we can see up there in some of this. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. But I also thought this was a good opportunity to kind of talk to you about water sprouts versus suckers. 
So if you look up here in the canopy, you'll see that there are some branches that just go like this one right here that just go straight up, very vertical into the, plant, uh, the tree canopy. And those are what is known as water sprouts. Now, a lot of times when trees have gone through stress or something like that, they tend to have this physiological response where they are just trying to get vegetation up there in order to continue photosynthesizing. Um, and so that is that response. Um, basically, they were dormant buds that decided to break and they pushed those quick branches up there in order to get more vegetation. So that all those water sprouts might have been a result of some of this dieback that we have over here. And you can see that overall the tree's got plenty of leaves on it. Those are some older water sprouts. But water sprouts, because they grow so quickly and they grow straight up, a lot of times they can kind of deform the canopy of your tree. They're just trying to grow up and get to the sunlight. Um, but that kind of creates a weak bond um, with the branch that it's attached to. So that makes it more susceptible to ice damage later on. Now it is possible to go ahead and, you know, if you really lost a lot of branches on a tree and all you had were water sprouts, to potentially train one of those water sprouts into becoming a new uh, branch. But really you can see we have a lot of good healthy branches here. So we're gonna make sure that we prune out any of those water sprouts so that we don't have potentially um, more damage as we go into the future. Now down below here, what you see, these are actually suckers. So water sprouts are in the tree, suckers are um, the roots that have dormant buds that are breaking and coming up. Now, a lot of times we'll see this on especially grafted trees. Um, and again, this can be a response of stress. So it might be that there was construction or soil compaction that occurred around here. Again, causing those roots to think, oh, I need to put more vegetation up in order to increase my photosynthesis and sugar. Um, and so they're doing this. Now on a jujube and like other fruit trees, a lot of times they are grafted. So what we have up here is actually a thornless um, cultivar, but down here, because this is growing off of the rootstock, not the um, scion, it actually is a different type of jujube. And you'll notice, you have to be careful with this because it has thorns on it. So that's kind of a concern here is any of these suckers that are coming up have thorns versus the main primary tree that we're trying to cultivate and grow here in the garden. So when we have this, um, we're just gonna use our hand pruners and go ahead and clip these down. Now you can see here, we're in a lawn situation. Um, so if these do decide to re-sprout, one easy way of maintaining these is just simply to continue to mow around it. You just wanna be careful around the base of your tree and not hit the base of your tree with your mower or weed eater or anything like that. Um, there are some products on the market that talk about kind of suppressing sucker growth. Now, there haven't been a lot of research on those, um, and you just want to be careful that you're not spraying any herbicide on these because sometimes that herbicide can translocate and cause some damage to your primary plant that you're wanting to keep. So at this point, you got to gather some equipment. Obviously, hand pruners work on this, but when we're going up into the canopy, we're going to look at some other equipment. So we've got our ladder here. Um, if you're up on the ladder, make sure you're using your safety uh, precautions, safety glasses, um, having somebody to help hold that ladder for you. And then there's a couple of different tools that we can use, such as your loppers, some telescoping loppers will help you reach a little bit more. If you're a bit more cautious and don't want to get off the ground, that is perfectly okay. They have telescoping um, saws that you can use. And the nice thing about those is they kind of will get in there. Um, you have to have some good arm strength to kind of work those, but they also have a string on there that you can pull that string and it also acts like a little hand pruner so you can clip some smaller branches off of them. Now we also have a pole chainsaw that we can use. It is a bit heavier, keep that in mind. So when you're using it, it is heavier, um, but it also is a lot quicker. You don't have to kind of have that sawing action yourself with your arms. Um, it will do it for it. You just want to be careful because of that blade is a little bit wider that you're not unintentionally cutting something else on the top side of that blade as you go up into the canopy of the tree. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and um, finish up our suckers here and then move on up and clean this tree.
So now that we've got all of the dead trimmed out and the uh, water sprouts that were growing up in the canopy as well as the shoots, um, you can see the tree looks a lot better. It does look a little thinner, but you can see predominantly that most everything that we took out was dead um, branches and not actually live vegetation. So all of this was just potentially harboring insects and, and uh, an entry for pathogens to get into this healthy, otherwise healthy tree. And the good thing now is when we are able to harvest our jujubes later in the season, we won't be contending with all these dead branches in the canopy. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Join us next week as we look at begonias and Brussels sprouts right here on Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriters, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, and Shape Your Future, a program of the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust. Additional support is also provided by Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticulture Society, the Tulsa Garden Club, and the Tulsa Garden Center.